Um, I'd like to start uh, the discussion by addressing the issue of dehydration and nutrition. And I think I want to hear from the palliative care team. Dr. Ebru Kaya is with us, and she's a palliative care physician. And she will talk to us about um, why palliative care team tends to consider stopping IV hydration and nutrition, and what's the rationale behind doing that. I feel like a lot of pressure now, because I'm representing the whole of palliative care. <laughs> So I'm going to do my best. I've got some palliative care colleagues in the audience who can step up and help. But there are lots and lots of reasons, I think. And, um, and the question is quite broad. And the question can be split up into being a bit more specific as well. You know, Shabir and I were talking during l the lunch break about how sometimes, um, you know, this culture of palliative care is associated with stopping feeding, artificial feeding, IV hydration, and some other invasive therapies. And there's lots of reasons for that. And I'm going to do my best to go through some of them in as, in as little detail as I can. But really, um, part of it is to do with um, you know, our knowledge as clinicians on um, you know, when we, when we make treatment decisions as a clinician, we base it on the best possible evidence there is out there. And when there isn't evidence, it's consensus guidelines, expert opinions, and our own clinical experience. And what we know about artificial nutrition and IV hydration is that at the end of life, there's no evidence that it makes any difference to either prolonging a patient's life or improving their symptoms, or their quality of life. There is, however, a lot of evidence that it can add to a patient's suffering in terms of symptoms. And so on that balance, a lot of palliative care units or palliative care clinicians, when faced with the decisions around what to do with these sort of treatments, will, will want to talk about discontinuing or not starting them if the patient hasn't already had them. I'll give an example which is fairly easy, it's not contentious, but end-stage dementia patients, for example. Um, some people um, believe that, you know, if we, if we put in a PEG tube into a patient who's unable to, to eat through the normal um, means, that we're going to help to improve their survival. Our goal is to improve their survival, to in improve their quality of life, to increase their nutritional status, and in doing so, that we will improve their healing process and, and improve the speed of which we, they heal their pressure ulcers, and then reduce their risk of aspirating by eating food uh, from the mouth. But in fact, if we look at studies, um, studies show us that it's the opposite of this. In fact, the risk of aspiration has increased significantly with peg feeding. So much so that, that actually survival is reduced and symptoms also are worse. As you can imagine, you know, if a patient is aspirating the contents of that liquid feed into their lungs, then they're bound to have symptoms that we then have to address afterwards. And maybe they didn't have those symptoms to begin with. So that's a very kind of simple basic example. And there are many others. But another reason why I think in palliative care hospices and, and palliative care units we don't offer this stuff is also because with the limited resources that we have in hospices and palliative care units across Canada, and resources do vary wildly, there are units that are very well equipped, very well resourced, that are capable of providing very invasive type procedures, but the vast majority of them don't. And so these units prioritize what they feel is the human aspects of looking after patients. So rather than devoting what little time they have to machinery, to, address, to looking at you know, numbers, blood work, investigations, kind of a invasive treatments that can be provided in acute care, they focus on the things that they're very skilled at doing that other acute care facilities or long-term care facilities aren't so good at, and that's the human side of suffering. You know, the conversations, the communication stuff, helping them with, with this 
kind of final process in their life, bringing families together, addressing those needs, that's what they tend to focus on and they do very well because they don't often have the resources to do everything. I don't know if that helped. Okay. Sure. So, uh, Dr. Alibai, I want you to respond to Dr. Bedeila's uh, ethical oh, questions, yes. the case that... Well, I'd like to respond to, uh, to, to Ebru's point, actually, okay. first, if I may. Um, and I don't want to argue or disagree with the majority of what you said. I, I fully respect it and understand, and, and I appreciate some of the discussion we had at lunchtime. It improved my understanding of some of the reasons why palliative care units uh, do not choose to uh, follow or, or, or um, deal or admit patients who require some of these interventions. I, I want to clarify, my, one of my understandings from our discussion, and, and you didn't mention it right now, um, but I just want to make sure I understood that most palliative care units will allow subcutaneous fluid infusion um, in their patients, even though they may uh, not want intravenous fluids. Yeah, so, in most, so that's one. In most hospices and palliative care units, subcutaneous hydration and peg feeding actually um, is possible. But I think what's more important is to try and understand the goals of the patient first and foremost. You know, what would be the goals of providing those treatments? And if the goals are within the, the kind of aims and the philosophy of the care that can be provided in these units, then they certainly would be encouraged and supported. If the goal is to help relieve um, hunger, for example, in a patient with advanced head and neck cancer, um, a peg tube maybe might be completely appropriate in that instance. But in a patient who isn't experiencing hunger, who's not thirsty, who is you know, already showing signs that they're not capable of uh, managing the fluids in their arteries and veins the way a patient you know, um, who's much more well than them so if, they're, if they've got edema, if they've got secretions, then by even giving them subcutaneous fluids is not going to be helpful. And I mean, I think it's really important to try to clarify the goals. And even in, in my talk, I talked about some of the ethical challenges that remain for us uh, in, from an Islamic ethics perspective. And one of them, I think, is really understanding the extent to which the duty to feed encompasses us as a society uh, of Muslims looking after Muslims and, and what it would take to meet that need, particularly if, for example, people who are dying and have advanced cancer, uh, who have significant anorexia and cachexia, if they're not hungry, um, what is our obligation? I think these are areas where we need further scholarly work. Um, my second point is that uh, um, if the best expert opinion from our physicians, and, and I understand that the evidence isn't always robust, is that, for example, people with advanced dementia, if feeding via peg tube is going to increase their risk of death, particularly because of an increased risk of aspiration, then that would um, be a greater priority than the need to feed. It would override, I don't use the tr word Trump either, it would override the duty to feed uh, in that circumstance because we do not want to do things that will shorten life. And so again, so much of it goes back to the medical indications or contraindications to feeding that would need to be considered in each scenario. Um, but the last point I want to make is that, and, and I've done an exhaustive literature search, particularly in peg tubes in people with advanced dementia, so, so we could argue that literature, um, but I agree with you, there's no good evidence that it improves prolonged survival, there's no good evidence that it improves quality of life, there's no good evidence that it improves wound healing. I agree with all of those, the systematic reviews. I will point out that there are major limitations in all of that literature and there are no high quality randomized control trials. Um, in particular, I'm very cautious around the shortening of survival because of serious confounding biases in the literature, but I will certainly accept that there's no good evidence that it prolongs survival, and, and that if there were, the, the ethical response would be quite different. Um, but, but, I, but I agree with you on most of those. I just want to make that, that one last point. They also, the, the, the study, one of the studies that I read um, that, was, that came out in the last um, few years from the States looked at the, the costs between, the daily costs between a patient having peg feeding as opposed to a patient not being peg fed in a nursing home. And the cost differences were huge. I mean, maybe this was the States and wouldn't apply to Canada, but it was something in the order of two to 3,000 US dollars per day per patient. 
And on top of that, what was even more remarkable to me in terms of cost was the time spent, the nursing time spent with, between patients that were peg-fed and the patients that were spoon-fed. The patients that were spoon-fed had at least 50 minutes more time with a nurse each day than the patients that were peg-fed. And I thought those costs were, were huge to me. And, and something and, and, that we need to think about. And I don't disagree with you. I, th I think these are really important factors, particularly uh, from an Islamic perspective and the duty to feed. If we can give any amount orally safely and people are able to take some intake, then that meets the need for the duty to feed. And we are not trying to prolong survival necessarily mm -hmm. with feeding. And I think one of the important uh, reasons why people put in feeding tubes that is wrong is that it's easier or they'll get more nourishment, they'll live longer, they'll heal yeah. their wounds. There's just no evidence to support that, and it's also not a religious obligation on the basis if we can give them moral feeding. And so I, I don't disagree with you on that either. I, I think that those are really important factors that aren't often discussed fully with families, because patients can't make these decisions at that stage, unfortunately. You want me to answer Asim's question, so. Before we go there, I think oh, okay. uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Sajadino yes, uh, wanting to say something about the discussion. I, I want to draw our attention to a very important uh, dilemma that occurs in the, on the ground, uh, and this is the culture of decision-making. And I think that we are assuming um, perhaps incorrectly uh, that the individuals are able to make the decisions in, in a very competent way, whereas in, in my own experience working as a chaplain in the hospital, it appears that in most cases there are surrogate decision makers, not the patient himself or herself, but more the connected families, more you're, you're actually negotiating the space with the family. You're negotiating the space for the final decisions more with the uh, connected, you know, group. Sometimes even the imams are not in agreement and you are really trying to somehow understand that culture of decision making because it's, it's important to keep in mind that many of the Muslim patients that I work, I have worked in the uh, chaplaincy, I find them, they come from the culture where there is some kind of authoritarian medicine prevalent in the society and the decisions are made by the medical professionals, and there is no involvement of the patient mm. in that uh, culture of decision-making. And I think that in chaplaincy also, we find that most of the time we are not working with the patient, we are working with the family of the patient. And it's not trying to uh, appease the fears that the patient might have, is the fears that the families have in the end of life situation. Terminally ill patients pose a greater challenge to the connected families, family members, than to anyone else, by the way, because that fear is very deep seated. And there is a fear that we might fail to do something which was necessary to do it. So even in the, in the feeding of the patients, that I think that we don't know uh, if the patients would agree, if they knew what was happening. In many cases, the patients might not agree because the swallowing has a problem. And the prophet's tradition is very clear that don't force your sick to eat. It is a very clear tradition which Muhammad al-Albar in this book that you have, he quotes on, I think, one page 56 or something, that he says, no, the prophet made it quite clear that when the patients are not able to eat, there is a reason of the sickness. The malady doesn't allow them to do that. Don't force them to eat. Now, why the medical advancement that we have, you know, somehow reached the point whereby we make a decision, I think that's a questionable way of handling the situation. And I think, properly speaking, I think there is more need to understand the culture of decision-making in the Muslim families, and the families who are connected with the patient, and the way the doctors and others are communicating with them. In many cases, I find that the communication breaks down, actually. It doesn't go forward. 
Thank you. So just a, a quick question. Um, how is to total parenteral nutrition is a basic care? I haven't seen any writings that have clearly addressed it one way or the other. My own reasoning in my discussions with, with some scholars, although I have not seen a written fatwa, as I said, is that it is not considered part of basic care because it is going even above, above and beyond using traditional means of giving water and food, and now you're really giving medical treatment. So I haven't seen a clear fatwa, but my understanding and my discussions with scholars so far, TPN is considered a medical treatment. It is distinct from feeding tubes, nasogastric tubes, subcutaneous intravenous fluids. It's a, it's a different level of care, if you wish. I don't know if any of the other people at the table have uh, insights to share on that. I think uh, I would like I'd like to just add uh, to this is when we have families, they, they need to make informed decisions, right? And if a team is available, all they're asking is, okay, so what are the doctors saying? What is my faith saying? What is my family saying? And what am I saying? If, if they're in a state to, to have that conversation and make that decision. Uh, we are doing these uh, discussions in silos, and that needs to change. They need to, we need to bring all the stakeholders on the table. Working with families, what I have found is that sometimes their, uh, their decision-making process is informed more by what they want rather than what is best for the patient. Uh, and that is where we step in and say, okay, this is what you want, but is this what is good for your, your parent, your child, or whatever, uh, and then put it in the, in, in the context of, of faith value. So it's almost you know, like somebody was talking about, we call the imams, they don't know, they are not connected with the doctors. But I think we need to look at that we need another professional in this field that connects the two rather than them talking, because I have to so many times translate the medical language for the family, and then the position to the religious authorities of what it is, and it's really a liaisoning position, uh, which eases, eases everyone, and they, uh, they learn. So I have never been in a position where uh, informed uh, information was provided, and that the family or the person were not able to come to a decision and be happy with it. So I think, uh, we need to kind of change a little bit of our way of doing things rather than just saying, okay, maybe. Um, on this uh, feeding notion, uh, so reflecting here, I think that um, I agree, Shari, I really enjoy your presentation. I, don't, I haven't read many Fatah on this topic, but, but thinking about it in a certain way, I think the connection that you just made, Professor Shadina, also connects us to the feed in this sort of way. You know that in the Qur'an, when Allah, so the notion of feeding comes, Allah says in the Qur'an, uh, right, that you feed those who, right, from, for, the, for the love of God. And then the prophetic tradition, the mutawatir tradition about, I was hungry, right, that God asked the individual on the day of judgment, right, so I was hungry but you did not feed me, I was sick you did not visit me. Uh, meaning that, I was, so again, the outcome, when we're talking about outcomes, this outcome through those traditions about the, the Farda Kafaya about feeding is the outcome is God's pleasure. It was no tied to this notion of someone's hungry, not that they're ill and we're going to improve health outcomes. And so I think that, that we have to be, you know, we're scientists, and so we say, okay, what's the benefit here? What's this or that? It's going to help wind heating, whatever else it was. But, the, but we have to, again, understand the context of this obligation was an obligation to feed those who are miskeen, uh, right? Those who are un, un, uh, uh, the, the vulnerable and disadvantaged in society, to feed them. Or those who don't have food, you feed them. So I think when we're mapping this song, we have to recognize that those are not the same outcomes that we're thinking about in the medical context. And so again, there's a, there's a mis, um, not a, a malalignment that we need to sort of fix and figure out what that means, right? It's not just about giving people food because it's an obligation. That was an outcome intended within those obligations as well. So I, I have a question that comes out of this discussion, but I don't want it to stay in that conversation. Uh, Dr. Alibai, in, in your framework around what are the principles of, of ethical decision making, you mentioned that uh, resource limitations or access is not typically a feature of, of the framework. And I guess my question is, shouldn't it be? Particularly in the Canadian context, I know that 
the Americans spend all the money in the world and they can afford it and so because they have amazing presidents and uh, <laughs> lots of money spent. No, I mean the best. Uh, the best. <laughs> um, so I'll give you an example from again our <laughs> ICU. Uh, I have or I had up until recently three long stay patients in our ICU. Between them, uh, two of them have passed away this year, uh, but between them uh, at the moment of dying, the three had uh, I think roughly 1,200 days of ICU uh, between the three of them. Our average length of stay in the ICU is about five days, and so you can do the math. This is, um, they essentially blocked the beds or access for a substantial number of people. In the face of this, we're canceling surgeries because we don't have ICU beds. Uh, we're diverting patients to Henry Ford in Detroit uh, because we don't have beds. And what I find um, is that for each physician making this decision around access for a particular patient, uh, when you get that phone call saying, can you take a patient with a stroke or for cardiac surgery or whatever, it's a decision in the moment. And, uh, and I think it's difficult to exclude, uh, actually I would maybe go a little further and be again provocative and say, um, social uh, factors enter into the decision by physicians whether to accept patients or not. The 40-year-old um, otherwise healthy person with four kids uh, who's a model citizen is likely to have people go over, you know, above and beyond. The 40-year-old uh, IV drug user um, likely doesn't. Mm -hmm. And the only way to ensure that we deal with people equitably is to ensure that we have one metric for everyone. That includes at the point of admission, but that also includes at the point of discharge, whether that is discharged to another place or dying. You know, and so this metric for saying we deal with everyone exactly the same way, as much as we can and as much as we can you know, respect people's cultural and religious sensitivities, but at the end of the day, this is how dying looks. It does not include one, two, three, it includes one, two, three. Um, so to, in my mind, that's the, that's the tie-in about ethics and access, is that if you can't control, not control, maybe that's a bad word, but if you, if you don't have equity um, in terms of dying, I don't think you can have equity in terms of living. And I, I, I would be interested to hear your reflections on that. Just, uh, just to comment on the... On the uh Nutrition to just to, co to complete the discussion, this uh, the uh, position of Muslim scholars uh, from the uh, International Fiqh Academy, which is um, uh, uh, which is under the umbrella of the Islamic uh, Organization Council, include Sunni and Shi'i and others uh, scholars. Uh, they, their decision was not to stop the nutrition, and also the decision the same with the uh, fiqh, uh, the, the fiqh council which belongs to the Muslim World League. So here is two uh, prominent bodies of collective fatwa. This is not individual fatwa, um, and they are usually uh, discuss this in, you know, in an open discussion, two physicians at least would would prepare and present a paper on the topic, and two scholars uh, at least would present, would prepare and present. So you have two physicians and two scholars. It will be discussed. If they cannot uh, reach a decision, they will uh, defer it to the next meeting. So, so far, the prominent scholars in Muslim world are with continuation of nutrition. However, they can receive questions and comments, and they always revisit what they are doing. So I would suggest to Dr. Ahmed is to write a letter uh, out of this meeting, expressing the concerns, and pro maybe, you know, we have the goal here with us, the Professor Sajidina, you have, mashallah, Professor Albahi, you have. So they can prepare, uh, 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 let's say, uh, not a question, let's say an argument, mm -hmm. send it to them, right, uh, and open the discussion. So probably after a few years from now, you might have 
different fatwa. Mm. Yes. Thanks. So it's, that would be on my agenda. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, we need to answer uh, Dr. Hadara's uh, question. So, uh, how can we reconcile? Uh, how can we like reconcile between what we want and between the uh, limited resources? And at the end, we're uh, we have like a publicly funded system, but it has limited resources. So, how can we make sure that we have equity? And we still be respectful to uh, to, uh, to 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 the patient and family's decision. Any taker? Well, what do you mean by equity in dying? Is it that if my faith says keep the person alive, whatever my faith may be, um, by all means necessary, right? But for other patients, uh, and, and that's what I insist on, and my family insists on. While there are other family um, other patients who are ready to go and the family says whatever you need to do. How would you implement that equity if you... So, so what I'm saying is that the conversation that we have on the ethics level says that ethics doesn't include resource limitation okay. as a consideration. Okay. And I'm wondering, is that... Mm -hmm. I'm going to start this, but I'm going to let you finish it. So here's, here's uh, I would say that, that the notion that ethics doesn't fill, I mean, that um, resource allocation is not part and parcel of what we're speaking about uh, within Islamic law is not necessarily true. All right, so yes, you will not find fatawa. That's because the question is, what's the priority here? And fatawa are usually at the individual level, right? You have state authorities to do things for different levels. They give you wide berth to, against state authorities, the Asa Sharia, to certain, to certain things for resource allocation reasons. Many of the fatawa that we get come out of countries that already have a certain role for Asa Sharia, right? And so they don't need to deal with uh, resource allocation issues at the individual fatwa level that we then take and say, let's try to apply in the United States. So, so that's, that's one point. Because it might be dealt with at a different level of discussion than in the fatwa. The second thing is that these, these constructs, like the maslaha, as was mentioned today, community benefit, you know, this construct itself has notions of community benefit versus individual benefit, right? Our notions of haqqallah versus right, haqqan nas, again, community benefit. And within that, research allocation issues or equity issues do come up, right? Or whether you try to balance them. We have fiqh of priorities, awaliyat, or what is a priority? Or even the maqasid that was thrown up again early, people when they talk about maqasid, they also talk about societal considerations, right? That then override individual interests. Um, so, so the armamentarium of Islamic law has them. Uh, you might not find them because of what you're looking at in the output. Uh, so I, I would not make the analogy that they're not taken into consideration because you don't see them in what you're looking at. I, I want to add to this. There is... Um a very striking difference between ethical methodology and legal methodology. Ethical methodology or ethics method is to provide you with recommendations of what you should be doing. What you could be doing, what you should be doing in consultation with your team. Ethics is not going to give you a fatwa, a legal uh, decision, legal opinion, which can be binding on people who follow that school of thought, let's say. So you have Darul Ifta, for example, in Cairo, and they engage in an issue like ours, end-of-life decisions. They might give a fatwa collectively, an opinion collectively, but it's not always informed by what we call ethical deliberations. There is an there is an involvement of what we call looking at the Islamic sources and finding a solution based on what we call casuistry. Going to the precedent, going to the back of the, of the fiqh, of the history, find out if there is anything going on there. And let's connect the modern situation with the past one. In ethics, it's an everyday situation. Therefore, bioethics is not exactly medical jurisprudence. Fiqh al-Tabib is very different than what we call the bioethics. The fiqh, there's no fiqh there. There is akhlaq, akhlaq al tibiya So we have two different areas of what we call expertise. We have still not been able to define 
the epistemological parameters of the two fields. We're still mixing them up. It took me 10 years going to Iran to make them understand that this is not fiqh tabib This is bioethics. Because they talk about akhlaq pizishki, something that is connected with, for example, the virtues that the, that the physician should have. On the contrary, what we are discussing is the right decision or the wrong decision made by the medical team as affecting to the patient. So we have two methodologies working. Let's say in, in our case that we were discussing today on the end of life decision. Ethical issues are quite different sometimes. We are talking about suffering. We are talking about the rightness or the wrongness of the decision. Whereas the legal fatwa is dealing with do this and don't do this. It's not bound to give you a reasoning. Ethics is bound to give you the reasoning. Why are we saying it? Whereas a, a mufti, you know, a, a, an alim, a mushtahid could sit and say, this is what I have decided. It's not permissible. This is permissible. Now, if you probe him, he might give you the reasons for it. In other words, in our field that we are working today, there's urgency. End of life decision cannot wait for scholars to come together and make a decision for us. We need to be equipped well enough to say this is the right course of action and this is not the right course of action. Now, it might not click very well with Islamic sensibilities or Muslim sensibilities, and yet we need to assure that we have not surpassed anything. We have not overlooked anything that would look just, just and or you know, unjust or fair or unfair. That's what we are really working with. So I, I get called all of a sudden from University of Virginia, um, nine o'clock at night. Please come, there is a patient who wants to talk to you. And nine o'clock, I was already back home, you know, and so I go back. And the question was, does the Quran permit me to say that I don't want to live? Now, what could I say? Does the Quran permit me to say that I don't want to live? Now, when you, see, when you saw his condition, because he was suffering from skin cancer, and every time they took him for treatment, it was a painful treatment, extremely painful. By the time he got back, he was again under you know, morphines and everything. And when he was getting up again, he would have the pain. In other words, there was no solution. But the modern medicine was saying that we can perhaps treat you. He didn't look that he was dying. He didn't look that way. Because we were, you know, you're supposed to cover yourself and go inside and see and talk to the family, talk to everyone else. And the final decision was very difficult to make. Does the Quran allow me to say it's okay for me to die under these circumstances? Now, whatever you might say, you know, oh, this is a test from God for you. You will mature spiritually in the next world. You will be... Nothing makes sense when a person is going through the pain, when that person is suffering, and nobody is in a position, neither the imam nor the physicians, to really satisfy and give the answer. What do you do in that case? That's the situation. I don't mean to say that there is always an answer for anything that we are doing. There is not always an answer. And sometimes we are speculating on what is the best course of action. If we can do that, I think, responsibly, then we have done our obligation. I think so. You don't really need Quranic sanction. Because the Quran is not dealing with all the details. It's just giving you, you know, that this is life. You need, you need to respect it. What else? Any questions from the audience? So I will conclude. Sorry? Sorry. Yeah, you wanted to ask what? your question? Oh, my question? If he wants to answer my question. Did you want me to answer his question? I don't have to answer his question. I can well, I think it. just because of the time, I'm going to, if you have <laughs> cancer questions, I have a question for Shaheen, which I think is important because you worked with the Muslim community for some times and now, and I think there was some, uh, 
uh, some workshop and some uh, training uh, um, workshop that has been done by your organization to help the Muslim community in terms of understanding palliative care and end-of-life care. How can we engage the community? What's your, uh, what's your uh, was perils of wisdom? You know, my uh, experience has been very positive. People do come to the mosque for uh, preparing for death workshops. Uh, because this is a conversation among Muslims all the time. Uh, so, yes, organize workshops. Uh, don't make it too academic <laughs> for our people. Just just bring the language down to a layperson's level. Uh, we talk about in those, uh, uh, you know, do, do you want to do DNR? How do you do it? We have lawyers on the panel. We have uh, uh, doctors as well as we have people who have uh, knowledge of Islam in this field because knowledge of Islam is also specialized in different areas. Sometimes you bring specialists who just want to talk about fiqh, but are not, um, not you know, knowledgeable about medicine or, or, or that process. So we try to find people who have that specificity. But uh, yeah, they love it. Uh, they are, uh, many have benefited from it. And that's why I'm saying my experience with hospitals and with mediating with families, with the uh, end of life decisions have been, uh, mostly very, almost all have been very positive because again, we give them the information, we have those discussions. So I think it is time that we started doing that in the mosques and in other areas uh, so that people, people become comfortable talking about death uh, not in just a theological be prepared for death till it's your prayer kind of thing that we say, but that there is a preparation for it. Uh, take, the, uh, take the concept of nasiha or wasiya that we have in our, uh, in our tradition and say, okay, so how would you talk to your families? My parents were very good. I made decisions for them when to withdraw the uh, support because they had told us at what level they did not want to go beyond right? Uh, and force feeding and, and all that stuff. So, and I'm having that conversation. So we want to make it normal for our community to talk about it. Just talking about death doesn't mean you're going to die, but we all have to die. So death doesn't discriminate. It's coming for every one of us. Uh, but how do you do it? You know, this idea of good death, what is a good death? Uh, uh, you know, what do people mean by it? So that conversation has to happen. Okay, we have one minute. Yeah. One minute? Okay. So, uh, Asim, explain to me in very simple terms. Very simple terms. Okay? Don't use, like, fancy languages. It's very simple term. It seems like it's okay to... There is, like, some uh, obligation to treat patient, or uh, at least it's as you presented. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's okay to treat. It's permissible, obligatory, if it's life-saving. <coughs> But it seems also it's okay to withdraw life support and to stop treatment when people are at the end of life. So a lot of times, people like the physicians, they struggle with the transition. When it's okay to transition from treatment to no treatment. In one minute. So, uh, so I'm not, I'm not, not a faqih. I, I was, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not giving a fatwa or a faqih. Well, I was trying to understand um, that switch myself which is why I try to sort of tie it to some theological notions of what quality of life means, to help myself as you are searching for when is that switch, right? So, so the thing is the obligation, as I said, when they talk about life saving, the jurists were talking about a certain notion of life that would be of utility, and hence I sort of said, well, maybe this has to do with, and you see it in many writings, with this notion of, of consciousness, tying it to the ability to affect good works, to worship, discharge obligations. So that whole thing is about, okay, well, if we can help people, if we, we're obliged to help people regain that state, if we cannot, it seems, then you're permitted to withdraw life support. Right? So when there are people who are in minimally conscious states, uh, they're not actually, the pen is lifted in a certain sense. Right? There's a hadith about this. Right? They're not obliged to pray or whatever else it might be. That most Sunni scholars would say that there is no obligation to perceive, perceive treatment there. And the point was that there are escalating harms, as you reflected back in my talk, escalating harms that can accrue with lo longer stays in the ICU. We know this. We know this data. And so the harms escalate as the longer you go and more interventions you try. And then you have to say, well, okay, well, even if this is not the Mukallif notion, 
when are now the harms of being in the hospital just too much for us to proceed down that pathway. But there isn't a, so I'm using it as, as, a, as I said, a maximal threshold to think about as you engage in end of life care conversations, not that oh, here is a determined line that you do this and you go there. It's just a, it's a, it's a heuristic, it's a rubric to think about. But I, I wait for the fuqaha to come up with one that is, you know, that is all clear for all of us. So. But in North America, they really expect us to give opinions. <laughs> I, I have been, you know, cornered in such a way by the family or the patient, what do you say? And um, after two, three days, you know, because you said we did it. <laughs> so you really... Yeah, yeah, because... Yeah, so what do I say? What, do, what is my opinion about certain things? Should we stop these, you know, ventilators? What should we do? And you are really in a, in a very delicate position. You are a chaplain. You are no more than, you know... You are not a scholar in the sense they would think you are a scholar. Uh, but I get, I get calls from Geneva in the hospital. And somebody says, your name has been mentioned. You, if you give the opinion, they will follow it. Now, what's the situation? So the situation is, you know, explain to me. And I tell myself, astaghfirullah. <laughs> May God forgive me. May God forgive me. And I do help out, by the way. I, I will be very honest that I have shied away sometimes. But many times, I thought to myself, that if I don't help in this situation, it's going to get worse than what can, you know, be done. So, I, I do believe in God being merciful and compassionate. He doesn't keep grudges, grudges like we do. And he has no law court, you know, whereby he will be sue me, suing me, you know, <laughs> for a wrong decision if I did that. You know, so I, I really take a chance. Many times I do that. I be, I'll be very honest that I do that. But... It is a situation that I, I want to underscore a very important human issue. And it's a universal human issue. You can't see your loving one die. You can't see certain things when you are in the hospital. And I'm, I'm telling you that when I was hospitalized for the first time for my heart attack, 11 o'clock at night, I'm giving you my experience. The doctors came, and this was the time when that new medication was found, you know, for thinning your blood. There was something like that, you know. I, I still remember the name. And I had not seen my children until 11 o'clock. And the doctors came to see me. Where is your pain between 1 and 10? You know how they asked you. Well, I said, I don't know what you mean by 1 and 10. Is it still hurting you? I said, yes, it is. Is would you say it's seven? I said, well, maybe, you know. <laughs> I don't know. You know. So, you know how you go through this a ritual, medical ritual, you know. You have signed all the papers. Now, they, now you have to determine what level of pain you have. And they told me, you know, if you survive tonight, then you'll be okay. Otherwise, something might happen. Have you seen your children? I said, no, I have not. Co call your wife and let the children come. It was very good, Dr. Cron, you know, yeah. So I, I called home, I, I talked to my wife, would you bring the children? They were, you know, small boys, I have two boys. At that time, they were two small boys. And I'm talking about 1978, 77, 78. And they came. And you don't know the emotional condition through which I went at that point. I can't even describe at the moment that, my God, I have survived. I'm here now with my pacemaker and everything. And, you know, I've climbed Mount Kilimanjaro twice, you know, during these, after my heart attack. So I, I'm, I'm trying to tell myself, you did survive. What can that, you know, be, you know, what, what does it mean to the medical team? And what it means most is to my family. They were the ones. I had, to, I had not seen my children. And my condition was so bad, you know, in the hospital. You know how things are, you know. But God forbid, if you ever get that moment in the hospital, I don't know. People are now, our good nurses, good, I, I don't mean to say the medical personnel was not good. They were very good. They were very, very good. 
and the best nurses were in the ICU, critical care. And they were the ones who got our stories out. What happened to us, <laughs> nobody, neither the doctor could find it, nor the nurses in the no usual situation, but the ICU nurse was the one who would talk. What happened? You okay with your wife? Did you fight before this? All these questions come up and you won't believe it becomes your case becomes most comprehensible by your cardiac unit team. We are talking about health hospital everyday situation. I'm 76 years old and I have gone through the hospital, you know, so many times, both as a chaplain and as a patient. And I think that is the experience you need to keep in mind. The context is extremely important. We might scholars, you know, we sit in our ivory towers and talk about these issue, issues as if, you know, things can be, you know, calculated two plus two, four. No, it doesn't work that way. Medical situations are not that clear. In my opinion, they are not that clear. And therefore, we need to be extra sensitized of what people think how people make decisions and how do they come to terms. And the most important person in all my sickness was my wife. She was the one, what she was going through, nobody could understand. And she was not asked, what is happening to you? <laughs> she, was, she, must have, she should have been the first person to be asked about it. You know, I, I think there are so many dimensions of illness it's not a suffering at one level or another level. It's a comprehensive suffering. If you have to re if you have tools to analyze it, you would say, yes, these decisions are extremely important to make. Let's help them out. That's what I, you know, that's what the decision I come to, that they are not easy decisions to make, but you are there to help them out. And I don't think we should have shy away from making, helping them out, you know, to make the, I have actually, given fatwas many, many times. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that they, they told me, you tell us what to do. And when they put it on me, I saw everything. The case was right in front of me. I said, this is the way you ought to go. This is not the right way for you to go. I saw distributive justice as my principle, maleficence, beneficence as my principles. And when I look at everything, at the end of the day, I could tell myself that's not the right way of making the decision. I never, you know, shied away. I'm sorry, I, I never did. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for the panel system. Thank you so much for the audience. We'll take a break, and then I think we'll, uh, we'll meet for the last segment of today's symposium. We're going to conduct a small group uh, discussion, so uh, we'll meet you after the break. When are we meeting? So 10 minutes break.